All right, turn to Revelation chapter 10 with me, if you will. Revelation chapter 10 is where we're going to begin today. Revelation chapter 10. Now, this will be probably a fun Bible study because it's uh, only 11 verses, so there's not a lot to get into here, but there's some fun stuff to get into, and it'll take us back to the Old Testament a lot. Now, this has probably been one of the worst weeks ever, I tell you. Have you had a good week? I hope you have. Uh, it's been awful. I went out to the woods to go hunting because the 18th was the last day of hunting. And it seems like everything that could go wrong did go wrong and everything that could break did break. And I ended up having to fix the tractor and do all these other things and just, oh, what a horrible week. And I can show you a picture of the deer that I wish I could have got and I didn't, you know. Um, but it's just one of those things. I think he was mocking me, that deer was. But uh, what was I doing this week? I was chasing tail. Yep. And so I was walking through the woods and he comes out and his tail must have been that big, a big old white tail. And running through the woods and you can't shoot them in the butt so I'm just oh I mean I'm still trying to get over not getting that deer of the season and now that hunting season's over but I did get to sit in the box and read the Bible and that was fun and I enjoyed that until all these other things happened and I had to go do this and go do that and do this and I was reading through Ezekiel and I read Ezekiel and I read a Daniel and I read some of these Old Testament prophets and I just keep seeing stuff in the book of Revelation back in those books as well so we know that Revelation is a future prophecy, right? We're not one of those people that believes it's all in the past. But what's amazing to me is that there's so much stuff in it that corresponds with the Old Testament. Some people say, oh, it's just a hodgepodge. And, and John just read the Old Testament and just took stuff out of that and put it in his book. <laughs> well, that's what it looks like to somebody who's not saved. But when you're saved, the Bible says in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. So, yeah, you'll find it back there. And then you'll find it over here. And that's God who wrote the book. And he wrote all those books to put it all together. So there's stuff in Daniel and Ezekiel and uh, Zechariah and Isaiah that matched the book of Revelation. And I got to see some of that today. And it was funny because as I was reading through, um, there was the verse on hunting souls and how the evil seeks to hunt the souls. And here I was trying to hunt deer. But I'm thinking, yeah, the devil's trying to hunt souls, isn't he? We've got to remember how important it is to preach the gospel and get people saved. Amen. And then I was reading something about as the deer runneth forth through the forest and, and the hunter chaseth after. And I'm like, man, that's me, man. Why <laughs> can't I get that thing? But anyway, um, yeah, so it was a, a weird week, a weird week. But it was a blessing to go back and read some of that Old Testament stuff. And I believe that God is the one who reveals these things little by little. So we see some back there. Let me just quickly give you a couple of examples of what I'm talking about. Go to Revelation chapter 1 and verse 8 that we've already looked at. Revelation 1, 8. Jesus says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come. Well, now go back to Isaiah 46, 10. And let's see that in the Old Testament. How do you know that Jesus is who he says he is? Well, it's the same Lord of the New Testament as of the Old Testament. In Isaiah chapter 46, Isaiah 46 and verse 10, he says in verse 9, I am God and there's none else. I am God and there's none like me. Then verse 10, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. So God is the same God of the Old Testament. And the way we know he's God is he gives us prophecy. He tells us from the beginning what's going to happen in the end. And that's what we're reading as we go through. Now, uh, quickly back to Revelation chapter 4. And we won't look at verse 1 through 4. We don't have time to read all that. But remember, we went through this already about how there was a door open in heaven. And then in verse 3 and 4, he tells you what he saw. And it was uh, like in a jasper and a sardin stone and a rainbow around the throne, like in the emerald. And he saw these uh, elders and he saw these things. Well, let's go to Ezekiel chapter 1. Ezekiel saw the same thing. Ezekiel chapter 1. Ezekiel, of course, is after the book of uh, Lamentations, after Jeremiah. Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 4. And I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, and a great cloud and fire unfolding itself. And the brightness was about it, and out of the midst thereof as the color of amber out of the midst of the fire. Also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. We saw this in Revelation. And this was their appearance. They had the likeness of men. Now, you know, you can read the rest of there of what he saw, but... What he saw is what John saw. Okay, so you see how it all matches. All right, there's some people say, well, the Bible is just so full of errors and mistakes. I haven't found one yet. All I see is it matches with all the Old Testament books. Revelation chapter 6, 
We looked at this uh, a couple times ago in our teaching. But Revelation 6, verse 1 through 8, we see the four horsemen of the apocalypse. How amazing when we turn back to the book of Zechariah, chapter 6. Actually, same chapter number. Zechariah, chapter 6. And look at what we see there. Now, Zechariah, you come after Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk. There's Sephaniah, not Sephaniah, Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 6, verse 1 through 4. Oops, I'll get that later. 6, 1 through 4. And I turned and I lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, there came four chariots out from between two mountains, and the mountains were mountains of brass. And the first chariot were red horses, and the second chariot black horses, and the third chariot white horses, and then the fourth had what? Bay horses. So you've got the four horsemen of the apocalypse in Revelation. Here you've got four chariots, and the horses' colors match, it sounds like. So this is amazing when you're reading the book of Revelation, and you should know your Bible when you read the Revelation. It should jog your memory. and You go, oh, I remember reading something like that back over there. But a lot of people don't read their Bible, do they? So they don't even know that back there he mentions something, that over here he mentions, and they align. So today we're going to see even more similarities in Revelation with some Old Testament prophetical books. And I want to get to some other Old Testament verses as well. So let's get started today. But before we do, I went ahead and wrote this up. Now I've told you that the Bible is amazing. How does the New Testament start? With four books, all retelling the same thing. And that was the life of Christ. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John called the Gospels, because Gospel means good news. Four times God told us what happened. Here we are in the last book of the New Testament, and four times in the book of Revelation, God tells us what's going to happen in the future. And I've told you that before, but I never showed you where the four times were. So I wanted to write that up here. Here are our chapters. This is kind of the, the um, overview of the book of Revelation. The seven churches are in two through three, chapters two through three. Chapter four, door open in heaven. There's your rapture. We don't see the rapture in the rest of the book because it takes place first. That's why we believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. The church leaves so then God can go to judging the world. And go back to dealing with the Jews. So chapter 5, he tells us about what's in heaven. Chapter 6, he talks about the six seals. And we see that talking about the tribulation and the Armageddon. So a lot of what we're seeing is, is after the rapture, a retelling of events that take place from here to here. So there's the first time we see that. Then chapter 7 is kind of parenthetical. We looked at that. Chapter 8 is the seventh seal, then the first through the fourth trumpet. Chapter 9 is the fifth through the sixth trumpet. Now, when is this taking place? During the tribulation. Then we see the seven thunders. That's what we're going to look at today, the seven thunders. And oddly enough, God doesn't tell us what those are. There are some things that God keeps back from us that He doesn't tell us. First thing I'm going to ask when I get to heaven is, All right, Lord, what are the seven thunders? Because you didn't tell us. And he didn't, he didn't tell us because He told John, Don't write that down. I don't know why. I've always wondered about that. Number two... Or the second retelling of the same thing is chapter 11 when the two witnesses show up in the tribulation. Then we see the seventh trumpet. We see Armageddon, Millennium, and even the great white throne of judgment way out here. So that's the second time we see a retelling of the same events taking place. Chapter 12, the Jews are in the tribulation. Chapter 13, the beast or the Antichrist. When is that? The tribulation. Chapter 14, you have the 144,000 mentioned, and then Babylon falls, then Armageddon again. And that's a great passage, verse 14 through 20, of Armageddon. So there's your third time you see the retelling. Isn't that amazing? God, four times. I mean, there'll be no excuse when people go before the judgment. Well, I didn't know. You didn't know. I only told you four times, you know, God's going to say. Why didn't you know? God does that. He repeats and, and tells you there's no excuse for someone to not know what's going to take place when we've been told several times. Chapter 15 is the last seven plagues mentioned, but they're not given until chapter 16. Chapter 17, 18 is Mystery Babylon, and chapter 18 is when it's destroyed. Then, chapter 19, one of the most powerful chapters in the whole book of Revelation, starts with the marriage supper. That's, that'd be us up here. And then Armageddon down here. And then so um, that'd be the fourth time. It's a retelling. So it's a retelling of events from here to here. Do you all see that? Chapter 20 is Satan is bound in the great white throne of judgment. Chapter 21 and chapter 22, new heaven, new earth, river of life, and closing. So I wanted to show you that so you know where the four times that it's retold over again. Now I get goosebumps when I talk about stuff like that. Only God could write a book like that. 
where he used men over something like 1,600 years and 66 books, and they all line up together, and they all can. Oh, man wouldn't do that. You get 66 men together to write something, every one of them say something different, wouldn't they? And they never would agree. Only God can write this book so that it agrees. So back to Revelation chapter 10, where we'll start today, and this will be our chapter that we go through. Revelation chapter 10. Now there's some questions. The more I read the book of Revelation, the more questions I have. So I've been very careful to teach you what I know, but also tell you what I don't know. <laughs> and sometimes you read it and you just kind of, you're just left with, oh, I don't know. I don't know. All I know is it says that, but I don't know what it means because it's hard to understand. So some of this stuff we go through today, I'm still kind of going, well, I don't know. But I'm going to show you what it says. Chapter 10 and verse 1. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea, and his left foot on the earth. All right, so here is another angel. Which angel is this? Why is there another angel coming and doing this? The first angel is in Revelation chapter 9, verse 1 through 2. And he brings the first woe. Then we see a second angel in Revelation 9, 13 through 15. But then we don't see that angel sounding until Revelation eleven fifteen. 15. So is this the seventh angel or is this an angel in between these angels? Remember the seals and, and the trumpets? Is this just a completely different angel? Now the word angel means appearance. And the appearance of this angel doesn't look like it appears to be like a whatever angel that you'd see. So I think Clarence Larkin had the question and question, is this Jesus? Ruckman said it is, but Larkin said it might. So it could be a generic angel, but the way that it's described, it sounds like Jesus. Now we've seen in the book of Revelation, Jesus described as many different things, as a lamb, right? And things like that. So this could literally be Jesus Christ and him standing on the sea. Well, that would, that would point us toward Millennial Kingdom, when he comes at Armageddon. But this angel is an angel of the Lord. So this angel is an angel of the Lord. Well, Jesus Christ is the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. So he can appear as an angel. It has a rainbow on its head. Now, <laughs> should I go there? Nowadays, there's a lot of people that want to have a rainbow. This is not a gay angel, okay? The rainbow God had first. And then other people hijack that. What is the rain rainbow a symbol of? Back in the book of Genesis, because of men's sin, God destroyed the world and he set up a rainbow and said, I won't do that again by water. But he will do it again somehow by fire, the Bible says, in flaming fire, taking vengeance upon his enemies. So a lot of people have taken the rainbow and they, they've, they've used it as a symbol of, well, what the Bible would call sin. Because did you know it's, it's a sin to be prideful? Did you know that's a sin? The first sin is pride. Satan's sin was pride. And the Bible says that Leviathan, which is Satan, is the king of all the children of pride. So who is, the, who is the father of those that like the rainbow nowadays? But there's the true rainbow, God's rainbow, and to God that symbol's not bad. It's, it's weird how men will always change something that means wholesome goodness into something that, that they twist and pervert. But who, who else is in a rainbow? Well, in Revelation chapter 4, when it's talking about Jesus, why well, there's a rainbow around him. And he's clothed with a cloud. Isn't that interesting? Revelation 1, 7 talks about when Jesus comes and he cometh with the clouds. So could this be Jesus coming down from heaven? His face shines as the sun, his feet as pillars of fire. Where have we heard that before in Revelation? And um, verse 2, he has a book in his hand. So we go back to Revelation 10, and let's read that with this in mind. And I saw another mighty angel. Well, that's, wow, not just an angel. He's mighty. Well, Jesus is mighty. Come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of brass. So you can just make this some generic angel if you want to, or you can look at this. This is probably Jesus, because look at what he does next. Verse 2. And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot upon the earth. That must be a pretty big angel, unless he's standing right there on the side of the beach or something. And he sets his feet down on the earth, and then he begins to cry out, he begins to uh, yell. We don't like to say yell. That sounds bad. So he shouts something. 
I guess he preaches out loud. Now, what is this book? Is this a Bible? Did he have a Bible in his hand? Or was it a book of judgment? We talked about the seals being opened of a certain book. That was a book of judgment. So God has his books and only he knows what they say. And when he's ready, he'll open them up and reveal them to us. And what he does is he utters the seven thunders, which we don't know what they are. Now, I have a guess of what they could be. But look at verse 3. And cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. Well, Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah, right? And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. So when he cries out or he shouts out, he's like a lion. Remember Revelation 5, 5, Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. But his voice sounds like thunder. What are these seven thunders in verse 3? Seven thunders uttering their voice. Why is his voice like a thunder? Well, I don't know, but he's God and he thunders. And there's a lot of verses like that. So this must be God, Jesus Christ, saying something. Go to Job chapter 40. And it's not just in John. It's throughout the whole Bible that when God talks, it sounds like thunder. And a voice sounds like thunder. Job chapter 40 and verse 9. Hast thou an arm like God, or canst thou thunder with a voice like him? So God, when he speaks, it sounds like thunder. Now, I don't know about you, but I've been through some storms where thunder scared the snot out of me because it's unexpected. And when it comes, it's loud. Have you ever been trying to sleep? I was like, boom, boom. You're like, oh, my goodness, it's the end. No, oh, it was just, oh, it's just a storm. You know, have you ever been through that? So it must be terrifying. It must be terrifying. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 77. Proverbs chapter 77. So when God speaks, people listen. I mean, you can't not hear thunder, right? And uh, thunder comes from lightning, by the way. When lightning strikes, it makes that noise. And I was always taught to count seconds. And however many seconds later that you hear the thunder from when you saw the light, that's how many miles away it was. Have you ever done that? When you see lightning, I go, one, two, three. Oh, that was three miles away. And I always figured that. I, always, I think that's true. I'm not certain. But that's what I was taught as a kid. Um, Psalms chapter, what did I say? 77 and verse 18. Proverbs. I said, if I said Proverbs, I meant Psalms. Psalms 77, 18. The voice of thy thunder was in the heaven. The lightnings lightened the world. The earth trembled and shook. So the voice of thunder. Now let's turn over to chapter 104 and verse 7. Psalms 104 and verse 7. Also, 29, yeah, I'm getting there. We're getting to that one. Amen. I love it when you guys know your Bible enough to get ahead of me like that. Hold on, we'll get there. Amen. Uh, we're going to read a lot of Psalms 29. But Psalms 104 and verse 7 says, At thy rebuke they fled. At the voice of thy thunder they hasted away. So it sounds almost like this is going to be a voice of rebuke. When he comes and he thunders, when Jesus says something, you know that old saying, when E.F. Hutton speaks, people listen. No, when Jesus speaks, people listen. Amen. So when he speaks, he has something important to say. Uh, flip back on the other side to Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 2. It sounds like thunder, but it also sounds like water. How can it sound like water and thunder at the same time? I have no idea. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 2. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder and I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. So the voice of many waters that was like a thunder. Now one time I went up to Canada to uh, that big huge waterfall, Horseshoe Falls, what's it called? Niagara Falls, right next to Howard Horseshoe Falls, Niagara Falls. And that water was falling so fast and was so loud, it was like, <laughs> it was, I mean, you could almost feel it. That must be what it's like. You can almost feel thunder. You can almost feel that water falling. It's just such a massive amount. So that's what the voice of the Lord sounds like. So let's go to Psalms chapter 29 now. And the question I have is, what would these seven thunders be? Because back in Revelation chapter 10, we didn't read it yet. But in verse 4, he says, seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered and write them not. So we're not given in the book of Revelation these seven thunders. We're not told what it says. So is it possible that, that they've already been written down? And that's why he says not to, because it's already. Been, and if you knew your Bible, you could find these seven thunders. I don't know. But let's look at this. Psalms chapter 29. We're going to read. The
whole chapter. Psalms chapter 29, verse 1. Give unto the Lord, O ye mighty. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due to His name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. Hmm. Okay. The God of glory thundereth. So the voice of the Lord upon the waters, that would be one. Verse 2. The voice of the Lord is powerful. That's two. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. That's three. The voice of the Lord breaketh the cedars. That would be four. Yea, the Lord breaketh the cedars of Lebanon. He maketh them also to skip like a calf, Lebanon and, and Syrian like a young unicorn. The voice of the Lord divided the flames of fire. That's five. It mentions the voice of the Lord seven times in this chapter. You see what I'm saying? The number six one would be the eighth verse. The voice of the Lord shaketh the wilderness. The Lord shaketh the wilderness of Kadesh. So these thunders, it sounds like there's judgment, like there's fire, like there's breaking, like sounds like Armageddon, doesn't it? <laughs> what will happen? Out of his mouth goeth a sword of flaming fire. The seventh is in verse nine. The voice of the Lord maketh the hinds to calve, calve, and discovereth the forest. And in his temple doth everyone speak of his glory. The Lord sitteth upon the flood. Yea, the Lord sitteth king forever. When does he sit up king forever? Well, he starts his kingdom after Armageddon. The Lord will give strength to his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. Now let's go to Isaiah real quick. So could those be the seven voices of the Lord and what they do? I don't know. But it is an interesting possibility. Very interesting. Um, Isaiah 29. Who wrote this book? God. So the Holy Spirit is speaking through these people being written down. So it could be the Holy Spirit spilled the beans. <laughs> could be the Holy Spirit talked and, and said the seven thunders. Wouldn't that be interesting? Um, Isaiah 29, verse 6 through 14. Thou shalt be visited of the Lord of hosts with thunder and with earthquake and with great noise and with storm and tempest and the flame of devouring fire. And the multitude of all the nations that fight against Ariel. Now, Ariel is a nickname that God uses for Jerusalem. So whenever it says Ariel in the Bible, that's talking about Jerusalem. Even all that fight against her and her munition and that distress her shall be as a dream of a night vision. It shall even be as when a hungry man dreameth and beholdeth, he eateth, but he awaketh and his soul is empty. You ever had that dream where you eat a lot and you wake up and you're like, oh man, that was just a dream and you're still hungry? I never have. I guess I eat too much before I go to bed. But anyway, and or as when a thirsty man dreameth, and behold, he drinketh. Now, um, I won't go there, but when you're a kid and you wet the bed, you ever have that dream? <laughs> Where you get up and go to the bathroom, only you wake up in the morning and you didn't get up to go to the bathroom? That's a horrible dream. Anyway, but he awaketh, and behold, he is faint, and his soul hath appetite. So shall the multitude of all the nations be that fight against Mount Zion. When do all the nations go up to fight against Zion? in the tribulation when the Antichrist takes it over. Verse 9, Stay yourselves and wonder, cry ye out, and cry, They are drunken, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. For the Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep, and hath closed your eyes, the prophets and your rulers and seers hath he covered. When did that happen before? You remember a time when God used some angels to close the eyes of people? Genesis chapter 19, Sodom, the Sodomites. And he made them blind to where they couldn't do what they wanted to do. That's interesting. In verse 11, And the vision of all is become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed. We're about to read of something that's sealed over in Revelation. Of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one that is learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I cannot, for it is sealed. And the book is delivered to him that is not learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I am not learned. Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth, and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder. For the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. And then the next one is woe, verse 15. Remember the three woes in the book of Revelation? I mean, it's all, it's all back there if you'll read it. Scripture with Scripture. So could this be, it starts with thunder, Armageddon, and then Jesus reigning over the millennial kingdom and then opening up what was sealed so that it can be presented during that time. It all points to Armageddon to me. So back to Revelation chapter 10. In verse 3, And cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. Now that's another thing. If you hear a lion, that's terrifying. Have you ever been close to a lion and hear him go, 
I mean, it just rumbles like thunder. Um, wow, scary. And when he cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. Oh, man, I'd like to know what those say, wouldn't you? So could they be back there in Psalms 29? I, I don't know. But whatever they are, sounds like God is giving judgment upon the earth. And this takes place when he comes back at the Battle of Armageddon and stands on the earth. And then he utters seven thunders. Maybe he's going to say, now this is what it's going to be like for the next thousand years. This is what we're going to do. I don't know. Maybe that's what it is. But uh, it just kind of bums me out a little bit that we can't know. He says, no, that's one thing I'm going to, I'm going to keep to myself. You don't write that down. <coughs> well, John knew. How come we can't know? Does that ever happen in the Bible in another spot? One more time, remember when Paul went to heaven and had a vision? And then he said, but I can't mention this because it's not lawful to mention. What was that thing that he can't mention? Boy, if I lived back in those days, I would have saved up all my money for a ticket to Rome to go talk to Paul and say, hey, what was that one thing? And then I'd save all my money to go to Patmos and say, hey, John, what was the seven thunder? Because I wonder if they would have told me. God didn't say you couldn't tell somebody. He just said, don't write it down. So maybe we could have gone and asked. And they, I don't know, maybe they would have told us. But for some reason, God says, no, I don't, I don't want those written down. How interesting. What a strange thing. Now, this book that was sealed, what is the deal with this book being sealed? When is there another time in the Bible when something is sealed up? Let's go to Daniel chapter 9. Now, on this occasion, God tells them to seal something up. But he says... You can write it down. But he says it's sealed up for a certain time. So in Daniel chapter 9, all the prophecies of Daniel, and by the way, Daniel and Revelation, you need to read both of those together because they go hand in hand. Daniel chapter 9 and verse 24, it says, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and the prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Seal up a vision. Seal up a prophecy. And then in verse, uh, uh, let's skip over to um, chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4. Daniel 12, 4. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. So we have the book of Daniel. It's written down. But in a way, it's sealed too to where what's written we can't really understand until we're in the last days. Because it's more written for us than it was for back then. So we're actually getting to see some of the seals being brought to pass. We're, we're beginning to, it's like we see through a glass darkly, right? But then it gets clearer and clearer and clearer as the Lord gets closer because He is light. So sealing of something in a book for a future time. Yet in Revelation chapter 10, turn back there, He's not even allowed to mention the seven thunders or write them down. Why? I don't understand. I just find that so strange. I would love to know. I want to know more, right? You remember that commercial? Inquiring minds want to know. <laughs> I forget what that was for. National Enquirer, right? Inquiring minds want to know. I want to know. Well, so what are the seven thunders? I guess we won't know till we get to heaven. But it says here in Revelation chapter 10 and verse 5, And the angel which I saw upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hands to heaven. And swear by him that liveth forever and ever. Now there's two ways you can look at that. If that's just an angel, then he's swearing by Jesus. But if this angel is Jesus, then he's swearing by the Father. Right? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Not three gods. That's one God in three. And these three are what? One. Okay? So he's swearing by the Father. And swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are. Now Jesus did that too. How? Because I and my Father are one. And the things which are therein, and there should be time no longer. Now when does it go to where there's no longer time? Well, that would be at the end of the Millennial Kingdom, when God destroys the earth and makes a new heaven and a new earth, and then there's no more time. So, do you see how this thing keeps retelling the same thing over and over and over? I, I almost found seven retellings of the same thing, but I, I said, I better not put that up there because no one taught that before. And boy, I hate to teach stuff no one else taught. They might think you're whatever. But there's at least four retellings in these main spots. But I did find it in a couple of other chapters too, where it alludes to tribulation, Armageddon, millennium, and then Jesus ruling for forever after that. So 
Revelation chapter 10 and verse uh, 7. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound. Now he's not sounding yet. So the seventh angel hasn't sounded yet. He's going to, but he hasn't yet. So he backs up here in verse 7. And it says, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared to his servants, the prophets. Oh boy, now we're going to have to stop here for, for a minute and just and go into this because this is something. What is the mystery of God that is to be finished? It says mystery singular. It doesn't say the mysteries of God. Now, if you know your Bible, there are the seven mysteries in the Bible. So this isn't the mystery of the church or Paul's mysteries, is it? This is just the mystery. What is the mystery? Now, there are seven mysteries in the Bible. There's actually eight. <laughs> and for many, many years, Ruckman and Larkin taught the seven mysteries in the Bible. But it always bothered me because the seven mysteries they gave, one of them was from John. And God always does something in the number seven. And so I said, there's got to be seven mysteries given to Paul. There's just got to be. And so I found it. So I'm going to teach the seven mysteries of Paul. So you can go to YouTube and look up my series on the seven mysteries. And I teach it like Larkin and Ruckman did. He had the seven mysteries, but I included the one from John. But there are seven mysteries given to Paul. And that's a neater teaching. And what is the, the one? Well, um, Ruckman and Larkin teach the seven mysteries, but they omit the first one. And they, in, play, in place of that, insert the one that was given to John in Revelation chapter 17 and 18. But if you go to Paul and you're looking for seven mysteries from Paul, look at that one right there. The gospel of salvation by faith alone. In Romans 16, 25, and I don't have time to go through all this, but in Romans 16, 25, he talks about, well, let's read that one real quick because that's the most important. The gospel. Romans chapter 16 and verse 25. And did you know Paul calls the gospel a mystery? Paul says my gospel three times in the Bible. Why is Paul in the Bible? Because God revealed to him something that's for us today. In Romans chapter 16 verse 25 says, Now to him that is of the power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. But now is made manifest, and it says, And by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, may know to all nations for the obedience of faith. So this is one mystery, and this is the most important mystery, the mystery of the gospel, of salvation. Go to Ephesians chapter 6. Why did they leave this one out? I mean, this should have been the most important mystery. I don't know why when they taught on the seven mysteries, they didn't make that one of the seven mysteries. I just, that escaped them, I guess. But um, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 19 And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. All right? Galatians chapter 1, quickly. I just want to make um, this one. This is so important. Galatians chapter 1. Look what Paul says. Galatians chapter 1, verse 11 and 12. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. So there was something peculiar given to Paul that is the gospel of salvation for today that wasn't given before to who? John or Peter or James. You talk like that, people say, well, you're one of those hyper-dispensationalists. No, I'm not a hyper-dispensationalist. I'm just a dispensationalist. And I wish I could be hyper. I get tired too easy. So I'm not hyper, okay? And I stay away from sugar so I don't get, you know, sugar rush or anything like that. But the gospel of salvation, what exactly was revealed to Paul? This right here, faith alone. In Acts chapter 13, verse 38 and 39, justified, justification. Justified by faith. That to me is what that mystery was. But because before they were preaching, well, just get baptized and you'll get the Holy Spirit. <laughs> That's very different than get saved and you'll be, be baptized with the Holy Spirit when you get saved. It's not the water that saves us today. So this is something peculiar that was given to Paul. And that is the gospel of 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, how that Christ died for our sins and was buried and rose again a third day according to the scriptures. How did he die? He shed his blood. And Romans 3.25 says, through faith in His blood. That's Paul's gospel. It's trusting in the blood atonement of Jesus Christ. Romans 5.11 tells us uh, we're supposed to receive the atonement. How do we receive it? Through faith alone. So that was the first mystery that Paul was given. That, hey, we're saved by faith. 
not by works, lest any man should boast. So that's one of the seven mysteries. Then there's the Godhead, or the incarnation of Jesus, the mystery about the Trinity, God manifest in the flesh. That's the second one. The third one is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, being sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Ephesians 1.13, eternal security, baby. Amen? <laughs> I, I get so just fed up with these people that email. There's no such thing as eternal security. Well, then you're missing one of the mysteries of Paul. What's wrong with you? You know, uh, Because once saved, you're son of God. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit. You can't lose it. Now, the body of Christ, which is the bride of Christ, is another mystery. The gathering unto Christ we call the rapture. That's another mystery. The mystery of iniquity, the mystery of the Antichrist, and then the restoration of Israel. God is not done with the Jews. And we will see that when we get into the book of Revelation, how anyone could say God's finished with the Jews. They've never read their Bible. They don't read this book because this is what it was all about, the Jews. And there's so many promises made to them, God can't cut them off forever. He's got to go back. One of the promises was to sit on the throne and rule for a thousand years. How's he going to do that if there's no throne in Jerusalem to sit on? I mean, it's ludicrous to not understand your Bible and not see these seven mysteries. Now, the, the, the other one was one given to John, and that's Mystery Babylon. So we'll see that uh, when we get to Revelation chapter 17 and 18. That's another. So you could say there's eight mysteries. One guy, he told me, there's ten mysteries in the Bible, Brother Breaker. No, there's twelve, another guy told me. So, but there are seven, God always used to seven, given to Paul. And this one over here is a mystery that is also a mystery, but it was given to John. It's no problem having another one or more. But it is interesting that God uses the number seven, so I see him giving seven to Paul. Okay? So back to Revelation chapter 10. The question is, what is this mystery? <laughs> what is this one that he's talking about? Revelation chapter 10. This mystery being finished. Revelation chapter 10 and verse 7. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared to his servants and prophets. So what mystery is this one? I don't know. Is it the seven mysteries? Is, is it a different ministry? What mystery is this? Whatever it is, it's a mystery that he declared to his servants and prophets. So this mystery declared to the servants and prophets, that takes us back to the Old Testament, doesn't it? And some things that God told them. So it, it's not the seven mysteries to Paul. Those are more recent. He says, you know, the mystery that I revealed to them back then. Okay, what could that be? What was declared to his servants, the prophets? Well, that takes us back to the Old Testament. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 66 and just get a sampling. Because when you go to the Old Testament, Dr. Rotman taught it like this. He said, 90% of the major and, and minor prophets was all about... Guess what? From here to here. That's what they all talked about. They all talked about how great it'll be when he comes and rules. And they all talked about, hey, Israel, you better get right because you're going to go through some stuff. The, the 70th week of Daniel and you're going to go through all this stuff. So Isaiah chapter 66, here's a mystery that I'm sure they didn't understand back then, but now we can understand. Isaiah chapter 66, verse 15. For behold, the Lord will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. That sounds like Armageddon, doesn't it? For by fire and by his sword will the Lord plead with all flesh and the slain of the Lord shall be many. That they that sanctify themselves and purify themselves in the gardens behind one tree in the midst, eating swine's flesh and the abomination in the mouse shall be consumed together, saith the Lord. For I know their works and their thoughts, and it shall come that I will gather all nations and tongues, and they shall come and see my glory. When is his glory? When he reigns in the millennial kingdom for a thousand years. And I will set a sign among them and will send those that escape of them into the nations to Tarshish, Pool, and Lud that draw the bow to Tubal and Javon, to the isles afar off, that have not heard my fame, neither have seen my glory, and they shall declare my glory among the Gentiles. Okay? And they shall bring all your brethren for an offering unto the Lord out of all nations, upon horses and in chariots and in litters, and upon mules and upon swift beasts, to my holy mountain Jerusalem, saith the Lord. And as the children of Israel bring an offering in a clean vessel unto the house of the Lord. And will also take of them for priests and for Levites, saith the Lord. For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. God says that to the Jews. Is God done with the Jews? He's saying right there, no, and 
there's going to be Jews after in the new heaven and the new earth. Oh, oh, wow. How about that? And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed them against me. For their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be abhorring unto all flesh. So that sounds like from here to here, doesn't it? So that's an Old Testament prophecy of that mystery of what's to come written way back here. And then it's going to be finished when he starts the new heaven and the new earth. So could that be what he's talking about? Let's go to Daniel chapter 7. There's so much to get into in the Bible. Have you read your Bible lately? You sit that book on the shelf and look at it. Oh, I love the Bible. You don't even know what it says. And when you get in it, man, you just want to read more. You don't want to put it down because it's so fun to try to figure out. But a lot of people, while well, they're just too busy, aren't they? Oh, heads bowed, eyes closed, no one looking around. No. Okay. Daniel. Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7, and let's read verse 13 and 14. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away in his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. Jesus comes back at Armageddon, rules for a thousand years. Then he destroys the earth, starts a new heaven, a new earth, and he's still reigning for all eternity. So there you go. That was a mystery back here in the Old Testament. I'm sure when Daniel wrote that down, he's like, brr, brr, brr. Well, when is that going to happen? <laughs> now we're looking and we can see it all. He couldn't see it at his time. Isn't it amazing the great time we live in where we can see this? Skip down to verse 25. Verse 25 is the Antichrist, and through his policy... Also, he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. He also shall stand up against the prince of princes. The Antichrist is going to try to stand up against Jesus Christ. But he shall be broken without hand. Amen. How? With fire coming out of his mouth. And the vision of the evening and the morning which was told is true. Therefore shut thou up the vision, for it shall be for many days. Huh. And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick certain days afterwards I rose up and did the king's business and I was astonished at the vision, but none understood it. It was a mystery to them in the Old Testament. They didn't get this. Here we are in the New Testament. We understand. So how about that? Let's, let's look at another one. Isaiah chapter 9. I just wanted to take you to the Old Testament today and show you how it lines up with the New Testament in the book of Revelation. And what this mystery is, is in the Old Testament, they wrote about Jesus being the Messiah and ruling and taking over the world. To them, that was a mystery. They didn't know the name of the Messiah or who he was back then. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born, for unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Now, is Jesus in charge right now? Is he ruling on the earth? So that must be future. So could this be the mystery that he's talking about? I think so. Revelation chapter 10. So it's the mystery according to the prophets and the servants. So not the seven mysteries of Paul. It's the, the mysteries that the Old Testament prophets wrote about the tribulation, millennial kingdom, and new heaven and new earth. Revelation chapter 10. Revelation chapter 10. And let's read verse, um, I guess we'll start here in verse 8. Or well, let me read verse 7 again. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he had declared to his servants, the prophets. So when this seventh angel sounds, it sounds like he's sounding at the end of the millennial kingdom. <laughs> there are people out there who say, there's no rapture till the seventh trumpet. So the rapture is at the end of the millennial kingdom? <laughs> Boy, do you have your doctrine messed up, right? Uh, so we got to wait a thousand years for Jesus to take us out of the rapture? No, when we get to Revelation chapter, I believe it's 20, it talks about the first resurrection and the thousand years and then the second resurrection. So there's got to be a rapture 
um, first before the tribulation. Verse 8, And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel, which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up. And it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. Now that's weird, is it not? Eating a book? Gee, that, that doesn't sound... Oh, that doesn't, I don't know how you do that. Mine's made out of leather. I guess you could boil the leather and eat it. But the pages and everything. Uh, eating a book. Why, what is this? Well, guess what? This same thing happened to a prophet named Ezekiel. Let's turn over to Ezekiel chapter 2. It's amazing how we see in the Old Testament... Same things that we see in the New Testament. Remember what I told you? The Bible is a mirror. And things that you see in the Old Testament, you see mirrored in the New Testament. It's amazing. So let's go to Ezekiel chapter 2. And look at what happened to the prophet Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 2 and verse 8. And it's interesting. We see a woe happening at the same time. Remember, we're kind of in the middle between the second and third woe where we're reading here. And we go back and look at it in the Old Testament, and there's a woe there too. It's just, it's incredible. So Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 8. But thou, son of man, hear what I say unto thee. Be not thou rebellious like that rebellious house. Open thy mouth and eat that I give thee. And when I looked, behold, an hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book was therein. In the old days, it was like a scroll. It was rolled up. And he spread it before me, and it was written within and without, and there was written therein lamentations and mourning and woe. Now look at the next uh, chapter. Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, eat that thou findest, eat this roll, and go speak into the house of Israel. Now, I don't know. I wasn't there, but I wonder if he's like, can I at least put a little you know, mayonnaise on it or mustard or something? I don't, it must not have tasted that great. But it says, So I opened my mouth, and he calls me to eat that roll. And he said unto me, Son of man, Cause thy belly to eat and fill thy bowels with this roll that I give thee. Then did I eat it, and it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. And he said unto me, Son of man, go, get thee unto the house of Israel, and speak with my words unto them. So he put that in his mouth, and it went down in his belly. Now the belly we think of is this area right here. But you know, the bowels is the innermost part of you. So in a way, you could say this is kind of figurative. Now, I, I believe it was a literal thing that took place, but figurative in the, in the sense that we need to read God's Word and keep them in our heart. We need to have the Word of God in us so that it can issue forth out of us in order to preach and to teach. So we see this taking place and we say, wow, that, that sounds just like the book of Revelation. So eat and speak. What was he to do? Preach or to prophesy. And uh, we see it's saying, sweet to the tongue. What was sweet to the tongue? Let's quickly turn over to Psalms 119 and 103. What was sweet to the tongue? Well, I don't think it was the paper of the book. It was supposed to be, the idea was, what was sweet was the Word of God. You're supposed to look at the Word of God and say, man, that's so sweet. And because I love hearing from the Lord. If you're saved, you enjoy the Bible. If you're not, it's bitter and you don't like it. You don't want to hear God because all you hear is the judgment. You don't see the love. But when you're saved, you, you love the love. Psalms 119, 103. Psalms 119, 103. David says, How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. And he's not going around licking his Bible, right? So what is he saying? He's saying, hey, the, the Bible is sweet to me. I love it. And uh, let's go to Proverbs 24, 13. What is it like? Well, we just read that it was sweet as honey in Revelation. Now, Proverbs 24 and verse 13. My son, eat thou honey because it is good, and the honeycomb which is sweet to thy taste. So honey is sweet. Now, do you like honey? Honey is great, unless you eat too much of it, and then you gag. You get too much in the Bible, you'll start gagging, you know? We're sinful flesh. We can only read so much of the Bible sometimes. And you just feel like overwhelmed, don't you? You're just like, oh, oh, there's just too much. I need a rest. And I'm going to come back and read it a little bit later. Because sometimes it's just overwhelming. But you should be reading the Word of God. Uh, let's go to Proverbs chapter 5. Proverbs chapter 5. There is an evil woman, Mystery Babylon, who's a whore. 
And uh, that whore, I believe I know who she is. I believe you all know who she is. She's from Seven Hills. And she's a city, the Bible says. Well, there's only one city on Seven Hills that would match that, and that would be the city of Rome. And there was this thing that calls itself a religion that started in Rome. And uh, she has not given us the Word of God. She has given us a perversion. When you start studying new versions of the Bible, they all come from the corrupted Catholic, critical, Roman, Gnostic, Alexandrian, Egyptian texts. So the true Word of God we have in our King James Bible, all other versions come from texts that come from that woman, that church, that whore, the Bible calls her, of Rome. Watch out for a wicked woman because look what the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 5. Proverbs chapter 5 and verse 3. For the lips of a strange woman drop as in honeycomb. Ho, ho. You go to a whore, you go to a strange woman, you go to a wicked woman, and you start kissing on her and licking her, and, and what do the French do? French kissing, I guess. And you start doing that, and you think that's sweet, don't you? Look what it says. And her mouth is smoother than oil, but her end is bitter as wormwood. <laughs> we talked about wormwood, was it last week? Sharp as a two-edged sword, her feet go down to death, her steps take hold on hell. Wow. Lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life, her ways are movable, that thou canst not know them. Hear me now, therefore, O ye children, and depart not from the words of my mouth, God says. Remove thy way far from her, and come not nigh the door of her house. There are people out there, oh, the new versions of, of, of the Bible are so great. I love them. I love them. And they say how wonderful new versions are, and yet they live like the devil when they read them. There's something about the King James Bible. It seems like somebody gets that Bible. Usually they try to live a little bit more holy than these people out there that use a different version. Have you ever noticed that? Did you hear about the revival in Kentucky that's going on right now? Did you hear about that? That's not a revival. That's a lie. <gasps> you just blaspheme the Holy Spirit. No, that's not the work of the Holy Spirit. You know how I know that? The work of the Holy Spirit has to do with your mouth preaching the Word of God. Where's the preaching in that so-called revival? Have you guys been following that revival in Kentucky? Ashbury, okay? Um, it's either Methodist or Episcopalian or something. I don't know what it is. But it's all singing. It's all oh, singing and singing. That's just singing. Real revival is preaching and people's lives change. And they get right with God and they get saved. Where are the conversions? Have you looked into who's doing the song leading there? They said the song leading is being led by the LGBTQ, XYV, or whatever those things are, and that they're the ones doing all the song leading. Do you remember? Well, I guess you don't. Last week was such a horrible week, I didn't get to put out a sermon of the week, but the sermon of the week before that was the one about idol worship, uh, idol worshipers. And do you remember in that sermon we looked at idol worship and how the Sodomites built right next to the house of the Lord and how they got into the house of the Lord? Do you remember that? You are not seeing a revival in Kentucky. You are seeing the Sodomites getting into the house of the Lord. And they're getting people to sing pretty songs and deceiving people into thinking that a revival is singing pretty songs. Where is the preaching of the gospel? It's not there. Where is faith in the blood of Jesus Christ? It's not there. That's true revival. And it's just so frustrating. It's sad to me to see people get deceived into thinking that that thing is a revival when all they're doing is just singing. And why is the world praising it? If it was a true revival, the world wouldn't be praising what's going on there, would they? What you're seeing is ecumenicalism. What you're seeing is false doctrine. Somebody sent us something about that revival, and it says, come to the revival for the Eucharist. Well, there you go. That's getting you back to Rome. That's not revival. That's getting people into the one world religion of the Antichrist. True revival is when people get saved by faith in the blood of Jesus, and they begin to change, and people um, get the right book. I wonder what Bible they use there. Did they use the perfect Word of God that's mathematically perfect? Did you guys see that live stream that we did online about the mathematical perfection of the King James Bible? How everything's divisible by seven in this book, but not in the new versions? Wow. I mean, Einstein said, I can't believe in a God that can't be proven mathematically. Okay, Einstein, go to the Bible and you'll find out seven this, seven that, seven. It's just incredible. Well, if Einstein was alive today, I don't know how he'd deny it. <laughs> But uh, where was I going with all that? Um, Isaiah 24, 9, we won't turn there, but it talks about strong drink is bitter. Be careful what you put inside you because it can be sweet if it's from God or it can be bitter if it's from the devil. 
And you got to be careful what you put in your heart. So Revelation chapter 10, and let's get done here. Revelation chapter 10, verse 9. And I went unto the angel and said unto him. Now figure this out. This angel is standing on the earth with one foot in the sand and one in the sea. My mind, he's like a giant or something. He's, he seems to be really big to be doing that. And his voice is like a lion and like thundering in many waters. And here's John up in heaven. And how does John do that? Do they let him fly down to the earth? And then he's got to go, excuse me. I mean, I, can, I, think, I just see John going, <clears throat> hey there. You know, not, hey, give me the book. You know, I just see John going, I don't know what's going on here. I'm scared of that. So, excuse me, can I have the book? <laughs> I mean, that's how I read this. That's just what I see. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book, <coughs> please. <coughs> and he said unto me, Take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up. And it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. So why is that? Well, I don't know what that bitterness is, but probably because it was condemnation. It was, hey, this is the judgment of God. And nobody wants to go tell people, hey, guess what? Bad things are going to happen to you. What do most people want to hear? Good things are going to happen to you. Why? We're just a small group here. You know, we could be a huge group if I Joel Olstein this thing and got up here every week. And I said, God loves you and you're so great and you need to have self-esteem because it's all about you. And today is your day because you're awesome. Uh, pass the plate, <clears throat> you know. And uh, you ever been to these so-called revivals in places like that? They pass the plate three, four times, don't they, in one service? And not only that, like, uh, like way too many times, too. Way too many times. Yeah, I mean, they, it's all about money for them. And guess what? If I tell you good words and flatter you, you'd be more willing to grab your wallet and give me money, right? But if I come to you and I say, hey, you're doing wrong. You need to get right with God. God's not going to bless you. This is happening and that. And you need, you'd be like, I don't like him. Right? Isn't that how that works? So it's sweet because it's God's words, but it kind of, it's bitter knowing that I have to tell somebody that because they don't want to hear that. You're a preacher. Hey, if you don't get saved, you're going to burn in hell. How dare you? Who wants to hear that? Well, I didn't say that because I wanted to. That's the truth. But let me tell you the rest of the story. But you don't have to go there because Jesus loved you enough. He died for you. And if you'll trust him, you can go to heaven with me. So come on. Well, they already stormed off when I said the first part. They didn't hear the rest. If they heard the rest, they'd hear the sweet. But all they hear is the bitter. Isn't that sad? So, yes, there's good and bad. There's the positive and the negative. You got a car, do you? You got a battery? Does it, both of the batteries positive? It wouldn't even run, would it? You can't have positive without a negative. That's the way it works. The gospel is four parts negative and one part positive. You know that? So here we go. Uh, let's finish up here. So he ate of the, of the book. Now verse 11, And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. So some people say that he's probably one of the two witnesses. I don't believe that. I don't think he's one of the two witnesses. But how is he able to prophesy to other people? He wrote down this book. And by writing down this book, we're reading it today, 2,000 years later. And John is still prophesying, isn't he? So that's what I see is by him writing this down, that's how he's doing it. But let's go to John chapter 21. Let me show you something interesting. And uh, in John's day, Peter asked the Lord about John, John chapter 21. And there was this thing going around that they said that John wouldn't die until he saw Jesus Christ coming back. And uh, so is he literally coming back? Well, all the apostles are coming back in the millennium. But how is he, how is he not going to die until he sees Jesus coming back? Let's read that. John chapter 21, verse 20. John 21, 20. Then Peter, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved. That's John, who wrote the book of Revelation, but also wrote the book of John. Following, which also leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? So we know that's John. Peter, seeing him, saith to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? Jesus saying to him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. What a thing to say. Peter, why are you asking about him? What, what if he lives to see me come back? Peter's like, he's going to live to see you come back? That's what they understood. Then went this saying 
abroad among the brethren that that disciple should not die. Yet Jesus said not unto him that he shall not die, but if I will that he tarry till I come. What is that to thee? And then he goes on and tells you who he is. This is the disciple which testified these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. So, how could he not die without seeing Jesus come? The only way is that back here, he saw it in, in a vision. Or somehow he got taken out into eternity and was able to look and come down and see it when it happened. And then he came back. So he literally said, so how do I know the book of Revelation is true? It has to be because he saw it and he wrote it down. And is it all past like the preterists teach or is it future? Did Jesus come back back then? No, then he must have seen something future. So we see a future of him coming. So back to uh, Revelation chapter 10. And uh, this is just a small little chapter, not a lot to it, but I just find it fascinating. There was a lot there and a lot that took us to the Old Testament as well and saw the Old Testament stuff. And so he said unto me, thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Do you know how many people over the last 2000 years have read this book over and over and over and over and tried to figure it out? Quick story and I'll be done. All right. I love studying your ancestry and where you come from and all that stuff. Right. And for years I couldn't find it because my grandpa didn't want to tell me anything about it. My grandma burned a lot of our records and stuff, unfortunately. So I had to go out and find where we came from. And I tied it back to this guy, to this guy, to this guy. And it turns out my third great grandfather is a Baptist preacher who, who said the opening prayer uh, of seceding from the union. Of course, he wasn't right with God because the wrong side won or whatever. But anyway, but, um, so I go back to him and his father, um, lived in Key West, Florida, and started the first Baptist church at Key West, Florida. Yeah, must not have been right with God, because look what happened there now. But anyway, uh, another story. But his father, before him, came over from Switzerland, George Breaker. And George's brother is Yuli Breaker, or Ulrich Breaker. Very famous over there in Switzerland, because he wrote some, some books and some plays are written about him and things like that. But there's the book. It's called The Poor Man of Toggenburg that Uli Breaker wrote. So he'd be my fifth great uncle. And Uli Breaker wrote Der Armen Mann im Toggenburg in German, The Poor Man of Toggenburg. And he said, in the Breaker house, by the way, you could still go over to Switzerland and see the Breaker house that was built by him and George, which I'd love to do, but I don't want to get on an airplane. I'm scared to death, man, to get on an airplane nowadays with all these. You know who they're putting in as pilots nowadays? Oh, it's just, oh, they're all going to be falling out of the sky soon, the way people are going. But anyway, but uh, over there in Switzerland, he talked about his childhood. So this would be the brother of my fifth great grandfather. And he said in their house, they were, I guess they called them Protestants then. And they were in, um, what, St. Gallens, Switzerland, Vatville area, Toggenburg they lived. And uh, they would sit around and read books about the Bible. And they would read books. And one of the books was a man who in the 1700s, hundreds wrote a book about Revelation. And so they sat around and they read that book and they all thought in their day that so-and-so was the hand of Christ. <laughs> and they were questioning, when's the rapture coming? I don't know, man. And they're, so we have a family history of 300 years of going through the book of Revelation in our family. And, and it was just amazing how he said they'd go through there and read that and try to figure out, you know, is it happening now? Is it... This guy, John, wrote this book and all throughout history, people have been reading this going, is this the time right now? Is this the time? Well, now we know this is the last days. So now we know we're closer now than ever. But I just thought that was amazing to see my ancestors would sit around and read Revelation. And be like, yeah, that King Leopold, he's the Antichrist or whatever, you know, things like that. It's just interesting. So that's John prophesying to many nations and kings and tongues in languages because they, they were studying it in German. I'm just getting goosebumps thinking about that. This, this book is alive and people have been studying that. And that guy, John... His book has been read over and over and over for the last 2,000 years and is still prophesying. Still. Okay, it looked like someone had a question. I was going to say, who was it they thought? Oh, yeah, I don't remember. Um, he, he was, Ulrich was um, basically kidnapped into the Prussian army. So who was that king, uh, king of Prussia? I forget his name. It wasn't Leopold, was it? But um, So I don't know who they thought the Antichrist was, but it was just, 
it was just funny that their, their day, they're reading everything through Revelation going, man, this must be, oh, look, an earthquake. Oh, I wonder if that's, you know, that kind of stuff. But it was interesting. And any more questions? Did you have one? Yeah. Well, it's not a question, but you bringing up the, the, what the mega churches did, meaning they like go through so much trauma just now. Yeah. Because not oh. only do they ask for a lot of money up front when they're doing the plate, but then at the end they get everybody really emotional. And they tell oh, people, yeah. And then they tell people, now if you want to unleash your faith and you want God to bless you back, do one more uh, seed so that you can show God that you're serious and ready for your well, there, That's a great point, because most churches nowadays are not there to study this book. If you go to most modern churches, they don't even give a sermon. You know what they call it? A sermonette. That's what they call it. And so for an hour or two hours, they all sing and go, Whoa, and then the preacher goes, okay, and he gets up, and for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, says something. Sometimes he doesn't even open this book. That's not what church is about. Church is getting in this book. You know how many people have told me, thank you for studying the book of Revelation, Brother Breaker, because our pastor doesn't even want to touch it. He doesn't even know if it's true or not. When he reads it, he doesn't understand it. He's scared. They told me, they say he's scared to go through the book of Revelation. That's sad. That's sad. I mean, what kind of person claims to be a pastor and a preacher and won't even preach from that book? That's a hireling, the Bible calls them, wolf in sheep's clothing. And many of your churches, especially mega churches like you went to, Joseph, they don't care about this book. Come as you are, leave as you will, is what they say. Bring whatever Bible you want, because you're not going to read it anyway. And if you do, they say, well, this translation says, and that trans." well, who cares? What does God say? Because all you're telling me is what somebody else thought that it should say. <laughs> no, I want to know what God said, and I believe God says it in the King James Bible. He gave us that translation. I believe His fingerprints are all over it, so I believe we go there. Now, most people, they go to church like that. And it's like you said, the pastors have been taught not to teach the Word of God. They've been taught to uplift people, flatter them, make them feel good about themselves, and then take a long time and get them worked up in an emotional state. Why? Because that's when they give more money. And so that's the idea. The idea is to make them give more money. And that's what it's all about. Now, are we here for money? <laughs> If I am, I'm in the wrong business, right? Uh, there's what a donation box is. We could sure use your donations. I would love to be able to build a house and have a better um, studio instead of the low light that I'm in right now. But I'm not doing this for the money. I'm doing this because I love this book. And man, that's all I care about is what does it say? And uh, if the Lord lays on your heart to give to us, do it, okay? Because you're putting up rewards in heaven when you do that. Do you think you're getting any rewards by giving your money to these false teachers? I don't think so. The laborer is worthy of his hire. Okay? What is the laborer supposed to be doing? Laboring in the Word of God and doctrine, the Bible says. And if they're not teaching that book, they are worthless in the eyes of God. God doesn't look... I, mean, I bet half of them, probably more, aren't even saved. This channel, TBN or whatever, do you know what TBN is? He, you, you, he, for those that don't know, if I can tell, Joseph had a contract with TBN. He was a singer that would sing in one of these huge mega churches, and they wanted to give him a contract. And they, did they ever preach the gospel to you, Joseph? Never. You weren't even saved and, and in that they, monstrosity. They caused uh, their congregation to go through like a Stockholm syndrome kind of. Thing, yeah, it's like, a PTSD to leave that place because it, they control you like a cult, and it's all about if you're not tithing, then God's not going to bless you, and you better give to me or God's going to do this to you, you know. And it's just, oh, it's so sad. And you got to watch out for those mega churches because God's on the outside knocking to get in, just like I saw in Revelation uh, chapter 3 about Laodicea. And um, it's just sad. And we, we, I won't tell them what church you went to, but it was a big, famous mega church where that man, he got mad at you when you got saved and went back and tried to share the gospel with him. And they banned him from coming back to that church because all he said was, the gospel is this, how come you don't preach that? Why don't you point people to the blood? Why don't you, you're, you know, and it's just all they care about is building a huge monument, a huge machine, a huge big, and then bragging on themselves. We're a small group, like Ephraim said last week, you know, wow, I thought this would be, well, why are we here? If you're here for me, please leave. <laughs> you should be here because you want to hear what this says. That's what it's all about. What does God say? Not, not what Robert Breaker says. What does God say? And so it's just, it's sad to see the modern state of America and the world because the churches are just so evil. 
They're not preaching what a church is supposed to preach. And their so-called revivals are laughable because the ones leading them are led by Satan. And they're singing their songs and they don't even go to the Bible. So uh, I wouldn't go to a, a church like that. People all over the world say, Brother Breaker, I can't find a good church. What church do I go to? Well, I used to say, find a good independent Baptist church. But even then, you got to be leery because some of them aren't King James. And some of them don't preach the blood of Jesus. So start with an independent Baptist church. Visit, listen. If they preach the blood, the book, and the blessed hope, then amen. If they preach something else, go find another one. That's why we started the cloud church online. The internet, they call it the cloud. Everything goes to the cloud. So I said, oh, the cloud. And people all over the world come and watch the sermon there every week and watch this teaching every week. And um, they're so thankful. And by the way, if that's you, send me some money. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm not here for the money, but hey, you know, it would be nice to have something to live on too. But it's just, it's a blessing to me to be able to do this because this is where we're finding out who the true believers are. When you get saved, you want more of this book. It's food, it's spiritual food, and you're hungry for it, right? And so I'm finding people all over are seeking out other Bible believers, other King James Bible believers, and they, they want fellowship. Because it's dry. It's a famine in the land of the Word of God. Just like it says in the book of Ruth. So, are you glad you're gone from that? What you call it? I don't know. I wish I could burn it down. <laughs> he says, I wish I could burn it down. Because you see how it's deceiving people yeah, I know, it's rather than converting people. I know. Uh, I'm going to leave that in. He, he was speaking figuratively. Amen. Not <laughs> physically. <laughs> but he, he was inside that huge thing thinking it was a movement of God, and now you see it's, it's a bowel movement of the devil, basically, is what it is. And it's just, they're deceiving people into hell, sitting in church pews, instead of showing people how to get to heaven. That's what, that's what sickens me the most. And they call themselves churches, and they call themselves men of God. Yeah. And when they would fit in better in a Baal worship than they would with God. Isn't that sad? Anybody else? Yes, sir. Go ahead. So you mentioned that uh, you know, Jerusalem had another nickname. Yeah. I'm how many names. Well, so Jerusalem is called Zion. Jerusalem is called Ariel, and it's called Jerusalem. And I think it's called the, the, the Mount of God sometimes. And there might be other names. I'm drawing a blank on any of the others, but that's Jerusalem, Zion. And it can be spelled with a Z or an S. Mm -hmm. and, um, so, and then there was where David bought the threshing floor of, I forget, the Jebusite guy. There's the name of that place too. Mount Moriah, that was part of Jerusalem. So yeah, there's different names of Jerusalem. But Jerusalem means the city of peace. And there has been hardly any peace there. <laughs> so when will the peace come? When Jesus comes. That's when it's going to be the city of peace. The Holy Mountain, it's called sometimes too. Another question? These are good questions. Laura, you had one? Uh, just to that, I've had people try to make me feel bad for not giving, and I just say, well, I wasn't felt, I didn't feel led of the Lord to give. Right. And if you don't feel led of the Lord to give, then you shouldn't give. Yeah, yeah. You don't have to give to anybody. It's something you want to do. And why would you want to give? Because you want to support truth being spread. I don't want to give money to something I don't know is true. But if I see something that's true, I want to support that. Because number one, I get rewards in heaven. Number two, it's encouraging to the person that's doing the right thing. And number three, it's, it's helping get the truth out. But a lot of people are just so willing to give away money to people that, and then they get in bondage, all right? So you went through that. I got an email the other day or a phone call from somebody who was asking about tithing. And they were all like crying, you know, oh, my pastor says, if I don't tithe, God's going to kill me. Oh. And it's just like, dude, you are in bondage to a false religion and I said, don't give them a dime because that is not God. God is a God of grace. He's not going to kill you if you don't give him something. And you're not even giving to God if you're giving to a person like that. I'll tell you right now, that person's not of God. So find a, a good church or find a true man of God that's preaching right and give to him. And they're like, okay, I'll give you my tithe. I was like, oh, <laughs> oh man, no, no. <laughs> but I mean, praise the Lord. We try to use it for the Lord and try to use it for living too. And, um, but I hate money. My dad said, God showed you what he thought about money by the kind of people he gave it to. Look at the richest people in the world. Usually they're scumbags. I've very seldom met a person who was rich who was a godly person. There's very few. And those who are, sometimes they, they're willing to give, but oftentimes they give to that crowd 
the false religious people rather than the true people of God. Ruckman used to say it like this, well, people with the vision have no money and the people with money have no vision. <laughs> and that's the way it is, isn't it? Don't you wish we could have more money? Because a lot of us in this room would put it to good. But we're making it check to check. And guess what? We're doing the best we can. While the government is taking all our money and putting it into stuff that we don't agree with. How many of you, raise your hand, are in support of Ukraine? <laughs> huh, none of you. Why not? I wonder. You know why I'm not? Because that's not America. Why should our money go to a foreign country? So if you really want to serve the Lord, buy some Bibles and pass them out, King James only. Buy some tracts, pass them out, help support something like this ministry, and uh, do that for the Lord. But don't give your money to false religious people who just use it to buy another airplane. You know, have you seen that so-called preacher that has like four airplanes? <laughs> and, and then they build big. Here's the, the way I look at it. We're not in a building, are we? We meet in a home. Why build a building when the rapture we leave and the Antichrist takes that? We just built a building for the Antichrist. Yay! I mean, no. That's why to me a building is nothing. I care less about a building. I just, why would we help the Antichrist out? I don't, I think the best thing is to get people saved. Let's build people. And then when we leave, people will know, oh, well, that was the true work of God. Hopefully, then they'll see that they were wrong. They were wrong. Anybody else? I got, I got Yes, sir. It kind of goes back to your mystery stuff. Okay. So the mystery that, that, that John's over. talking about here is a mystery that has been declared to his servants and prophets, where Paul's mysteries have been kept secret since the world began. Right. And they revealed to us the church. So... This, it couldn't be talking about these mysteries are over. It must be talking about the mysteries that were revealed back then. And so I tried to go back to those Old Testament verses about how they talked about things that they didn't understand. We even saw Daniel said he didn't understand that have to do with from here to here. Because why? Well, Daniel and his 490 year prophecy, 483 are done. And when did, they, when did the 483 end? When Jesus was, was uh, shown up, when Jesus came. Or the death of Jesus, I believe. So there's one week left, and it's this right here. Seven-year tribulation. It's called the time of Jacob's trouble. So all this right here is kind of like a parenthesis. I so like the way Clarence Larkin kind of does the mountain peak. Yeah, Clarence that. Larkin has it like this. Yeah. And so these Old Testament prophets, all they see is from here to here. So all they see is this and this. They don't see in here the church age, do they? So... Yeah, so we are really blessed to have some things revealed to us that God didn't reveal to others. And the Jews, they're blind. They could have had these revelations, but they didn't want them. So they're waiting for the Messiah. You go to Israel today, they're like, we're waiting for the Messiah. Well, everybody back here was waiting for the Messiah. They're right back he here. They're right back here. It's like this never took place when the rapture takes place and we're out of here. That's why there must be a pre-trib rapture, so that God can go back to dealing with the Jews. Because that's what this was for. To deal with the Jews. So, yeah. And so those seven mysteries of Paul, they're for us. So is there eternal security in the tribulation period? I don't see it. I don't see anybody being sealed with the Holy Spirit in the tribulation because they have to endure to the end. Where's the sealing if you have to endure to the end? And uh, yeah, the body of Christ, the body of Christ left. And the rapture takes place and then comes the tribulation. Then the Antichrist takes over. So that's a mystery revealed to him about what happens then and what happens here. So, amen. But this is the gospel. Get saved today. The gospel is so important. And would to God these so-called megachurches would just preach the gospel, you know? But they don't. They don't. They preach works because they want people in bondage to them. It's so great to be free and not in a bondage. Amen? It's so great to be around believers that believe like we do and they don't try to force you to believe like they do. Amen? It's kind of awesome. All right, next week we start chapter 11, which will be halfway through the book of Revelation. Can you believe we got that far so far? And chapter 11 is important, and it all talks about the rebuilt temple, which is amazing. I believe there must be a rebuilt temple in Israel, you know? And uh, I'm just so thankful. And when that happens, so many people are going to open their mouth and insert their foot. Because you know how many, so many, so many Christians say, no, that's not rebuilt temple. And then it's going to happen. They're going to be like, oh, man. So it's good to know the Bible, be able to say with certainty, this is going to happen. Because uh, it puts to, to shame the people that say otherwise. 
because they don't know the Bible. All right.